and the kids left. Well, Stephen, a flat tire, and he's gone to rescue them. Oh, Stephen, Stephen, yes, Stephen oh. Simpson, is it now? Is it Steve, Stephen there, or by is Stephen Simpson there? Yes, he is. Yes. I was just going to apologise for not going to your uh, your um, talks for the last two weeks, but Queens Park Rangers were at home at exactly the same time. I just couldn't do it. <laughs> so you have to forgive me. Sorry, no, 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 no. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think I think we can forgive you for that, Paul. Definitely. Yeah. Well, and they won. Oh, well, that's that's especially as they won. Okay. We didn't win on. We didn't win on. So I don't think you're on mute except for me, <laughs> Pamela. No second. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. Where's your husband? Okay. So yeah. The last two weeks have been. Okay. Yeah, Shirley's great. here. Great. Hi, Shirley. That's it. Mute all. Where do you mute all? Okay. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Not everyone's muted. Good evening. Good evening. Nice to see you all. So happy to see so many of you. Hope you had a good week and I hope you're beginning to come out of lockdown. And uh, who knows, maybe at some time we'll have real meetings, not just Zoom. But in the meantime, we'll, we're doing fine on Zoom. So um, before we start with Pamela, I'm going to give you two dates for your diary. On March the 18th, um, we have our AGM, the Hover Branch AGM. All members are, um, are invited and we hope you're going to come along. Um, the AGM, AGM will, will have first the AGM and then we're going to have a fun music, music quiz. So it'll be worth your while to come to the AGM. That's March the 18th. And then on April the 22nd, we have a speaker from London. It's a British Museum guide, and she's going to be giving us an overview of 4,000 years of Jewish history as is seen in the British Museum. And that's April the 22nd. Okay, so now to this evening's uh, program. Of course, I don't really need to introduce Pamela. You all know Pamela. We're, we're delighted to have her this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pamela. And this is what I'm going to tell you about this. I've frozen. This is what I'm going to tell you about uh, this evening's presentation. Something good came out of the pandemic. Isolated at home, Pamela Levine finally published on Kindle the book about her second trip to Japan in 2015. For those of you who may never visit Japan, the book can take you there vicariously and for those who dream of going it may help you to plan. Tonight Pamela will take us on an illustrated tour of some of the highlights of this fascinating country. To date she has visited Japan in three of the four seasons for a total of 18 weeks. If it hadn't been for corona she would have recently returned from a seven-week autumn trip. She has optimistically now planned the trip for the same time this year. Pam has been attempting to learn Japanese since her second visit, so far without a great deal of success, but hope springs eternal, and at least she hopes it keeps the brain cells from atrophying, <laughs> or atrophying, oh, he might have, there you go, and she's, uh, she welcomes questions, so now I'm going to hand you over to Pamela. Pamela, you're on. Thank you very much. Can, can you all hear me? Oh, they can't, they're muted, aren't they? So if anybody's, having, do we know that everyone can hear me? Thumbs up if, Thumbs you, can if you can hear. Okay, so I, I don't know how you do, but I've got, have you all got a big picture and the little ones down the side? Not Doesn't they, matter. No, no, you've got to share. Make sure if you can, that it's on the right hand side, because I've tried to keep the slides over to the left. <laughs> if you can't but it's just a thought okay so i'm hoping this is my only my second ever zoom and i'm bound to get it wrong and it's very weird that you can't talk to me so i'm going to try and share the screen and hope to goodness that i've got the darn yes. thing right okay have we all got an octopus thumbs up if you have yes Yes. yes excellent okay this is my book is called a golden ages guide to japan and i will take every opportunity to plug it but not quite yet so this is just to start us off the, the japan is such a varied country so much to see this is going to be what i like to call an eclectic 
collection, or those who know me better have heard me say it a million times as a tour guide, um, I have a grasshopper mind. So we're jumping from an octopus to a map. And don't worry, it's not gonna be a lecture, but just to give you a clue, cause I was pretty clueless um, about where, where and what it was. This is of course, Japan. And here, I, I didn't realize, no wonder they're scared of Korea, North Korea. And we can see that I put an arrow at the top and an arrow at the bottom, and that's to do with my travels. My first visit was around here. We basically stayed in this area, although we did go down to Hiroshima. My second visit, my third and my fourth have extended my range. And in fact, my last time I started where the arrow is in actually Osaka, flew down to Okinawa, and then flew up to Sapporo, went up here and finished up in Tokyo. So I really covered quite a lot, but the truth is I haven't covered anything as you will see as we go along. Uh, if any of you are interested, that was the statistics, just as a, a curiosity to get the, apart from the length, Hokkaido, which is the Northern Ireland, is four times as big as Israel, just that little bit. So puts us in proportion. Okay, what happened was I've kept these postcards since I was a kid in the days when we actually wrote letters and I always wanted to go to Japan. These, these postcards are over 50 years old. And one of them is what I always wanted was to see the gardens. And of course, everybody wants to see Mount Fuji. So what happened? I always wanted to go to see the cherry blossom, but the years went by. Oops, why is it not moving on? So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how and why I went. And while I do that, this is from my very first trip. And we, it's one of the places they took us to where this lady is cutting squares out of very, very fine gold leaf and it is pure, it is real gold. Okay, so if I can get her to start, and then I'll tell you about a little about. What happened was, for various reasons, I wanted to go somewhere that was far away, and I thought that Japan was the answer. It was cherry blossom time coming up, and I would go on an organized tour, and then I thought, I'm never ever going to go again. It's so expensive, it's so far away. So take my courage in my hands, I said to myself, stay on. Because after all, the main expense is the flight and the second thing is fancy hotels. So I found, I didn't know about Airbnb in those days, but as it happens, I booked Airbnb, I looked for apartments. I, for $50, I was able to extend my flight and I had a wonderful holiday, two weeks on an organized tour and two weeks which I divided between Kobe, Kyoto, and Osaka. And that was fine. And when I came back, it sounds crazy, but I just couldn't bear the thought of not going again. So obviously from then on, it was a matter of putting every penny or shekel or whatever away that I could and start planning. And I decided, I don't know how to justify it, but I decided I would go in the autumn. I'd seen the cherry blossom, I would see the autumn leaves. And because I'd been on a tour for two weeks and on my own for two, I thought, oh, you know, four weeks on my own, maybe it's too much, it's not the same. I'll go for a bit less. Big mistake. It just wasn't enough. Since then I've been for six weeks and I went for another six weeks and the one I should have gone on would have been seven weeks. And it's still, not, I'm thinking now I might make it eight because I've got another year. All I ever do, it seems, is, uh, is plan for the, for the next one, spend my life planning. So. In a second, when this lady's finished blowing her gold, I will show you what she, well, in fact, we don't have to wait. I'll show you what she's making. I hope you can see, this is mine. I actually just photographed it. I did buy it there. We, we went, obviously, there's always a, a shop afterwards. And this is what they do with a gold leaf. It's absolutely, I mean, even now I've got it and I look at it, I can't understand how they do it. It's just so exquisite. And Sorry, I didn't mean to go backwards. And just to show that they're modern, this, what I bought is for my um, remote controls for the TV. So a modern use of an ancient 
craft. The gold is one craft and this lacquer work is another one. And we'll hear a bit about it later. My second trip, as I said, was the one, it's the one I've written a book about and I'll, I'll explain how in a, in a minute. What you know about Japan, what's interesting is they're like us. They don't seem to, um, for, I don't know whether the specific reason for it, but they don't seem to import fruit and vegetables. So like us, the seasonal vegetables or the seasonal fruit always come as a pleasure. And they're very aware of seasons. And so when I went to the museum where this, this, fo this photo was taken, uh, the first visit, all the kimonos were cherry blossom patterns. When I went back for my second trip, they changed the exhibits and everything was autumn. Oops, sorry. Now, sorry, I think Shirley would like, okay, I can admit her, can't I? Let me admit Shirley. There we go. On the, on the right is, is, is what I went to see, the beautiful colours, the maple. On the left is an obby, which is a part of an obby, which is a sash that they wear around a, um, a kimono. And this one I bought in Kyoto, and Kyoto is famous for brocade. This was in a flea market, it's absolutely exquisite. I don't know how much you can see, all embroidered, gold embroidery, and it costs me the princely sum of 1,000 yen, which equals 30 shekels, because nobody wants them anymore. They've, in fact, they cut them up. That thing weighs a ton. You wonder how a, a tiny geisha could walk with one of the obbies, never mind the weight of the kimono. Uh, now they cut them up, they make them into bags and things, and you can pick them up very cheaply on the markets. Oops, why does it not want to move on? Okay, just to give you another blast of the autumn leaves. And this is just as you can imagine. And I, I think it's something we have in common with the Japanese because we do it too, like the red wave at the moment. You know, people just flock from every age and every, every background to see whatever is current. And this is the maple leaves. And look at all these people who are just, just there to enjoy this wonderful sight. Okay, so the book. Um, I... As I said, it was actually, what I did, my, my second and then always afterwards trip, because I was on my own and staying on my own, I, I realized I wouldn't probably be going out much at night anyway. And it would be nice to keep a kind of diary. And that would be the time to do it in the evenings. And between watching Coronation Street and other things on my computer, you know, vital things like that, then I could, I could keep the log. And I thought, well, if I'm doing it, I might as well bore or share or whatever your opinion, share it with everybody. So I put it on Facebook and I sent a daily log. And since then, I've talked about turning it into a book. So as, as, uh, as you heard at the beginning, thanks to the epidemic, pandemic, it was a lifesaver. I don't, to be honest, I heard one week it was a bestseller. And then I found they'd given it away for free. I have to share with you, it's been three months on the internet and they are three months behind, so there may be hope, but I just got royalties today. Now, if I tell you that I actually bought my own Kindle because I couldn't, I wanted to see how it looked. It cost the princely sum of £2.99. I didn't overreach myself. I think that's what, 12 shekels. And I got so excited this morning. Sorry, for those who are showing sh about. I got so excited. I spotted that there were royalties, not one, but two. Well, now, are you sitting comfortably because the drinks are on me? I got £3.96 and £1.72. How those odd numbers, I do not know. I bought it for £2.99. You could at least give me a bit more. So I don't think I'm going to be a millionaire, but you are very welcome, if you would like, to go into Kindle. And actually, if you're on Kindle Unlimited, you get it free there as well. But the reason I did it on Kindle will, if you notice at the top, I've got, um, obviously you can't click on it. I've got a link. And why I haven't made it into a book, about the fact I think it would be prohibitively expensive because of the color, but 
it's because every day I was taking photos and I discovered very early on that people aren't too happy if you send lots of photos, it messes up the inbox. And, and also for me, I wanted, I didn't want just three photos, I wanted a lot more. So what I did was because I had a MacBook and I managed to make sl a little slideshow, every day a slideshow or perhaps a theme, a slideshow, so it varies. And, and I shoved it onto YouTube and doesn't bother me if anybody watches it. And it means that as you go along every page of the diary, there will be one of these. So instead of me going on and on and on, you can watch a slideshow. It could be the cherry blossom. It could be like you saw the lady with the, the gold leaf. And that way it's, it doesn't clog up your emails. It doesn't, you don't need to download it. And that's what was, I think is a little bit special about the book because once I did the slideshows, I've also added a little bit of information. So again, you can just watch it, enjoy it, or maybe learn something from it. So that's my story. What I'll do next, and then I promise we're just going to get onto pictures. But this is how, if anybody's interested, and obviously you'll do it your own way anyway, but if you, with the internet, how easy it is to build an itinerary. And this is just a section of my seven weeks that I'm still planning for maybe this year. And what I do is I make a Word document of my own and then I start to fill it in. And I fill in things like, here it says catch a train. I was moving, you can see three, three different colors. I knew I was spending three days in the frozen north. So certain things will be fitted in here when I got back to Tokyo, there is an antique market. It's only the first and third Sunday of, of the month. Therefore, that got put in. And then other things, like I wanted to take a, a cookery class. So here's a tofu class with Yoshima, who I actually, uh, this is the third or fourth court cookery class I've taken with her. I did on a previous occasion. Um, and actually, this will be the fifth. Um, and Oh, this, I'm sorry, I'm an idiot. This isn't my next one, it is the last one. It's my last tour. Because I, some friends recommended a tour guide. So one day I booked him and so, slowly it builds up. It, and it, here I visit, I went up north for the um, ice festival. Well, you can only go on those days. So slowly it evolves. Obviously some things go, some things stay. Another thing I did, as I mentioned, I just said about the train, there's things like a JR pass, which is like a runaround. You can pay for a week, two weeks, three weeks. And we're talking vast distances and Shinkansen and free booking of the uh, seat. Well worth doing if you plan it right. So I will have planned to maximize where I'm going to travel more or not. And the, what, the thing about that is for me, I know maybe it's a bit swings and roundabouts, but you buy that in advance, you buy it not in Japan, you're not allowed to buy it in Japan. And it's, a, it's I can't remember, there's different prices, but 100, 200, 300 dollars. And I can buy it month to month in advance. So slowly, I don't like a shrike credit cards. You don't come back with a great debt, it's the other way around. You can slowly but surely, fit things in. By the way, I, I booked my flight a year ahead and that was an incredible saving. Um, so that's how, obviously for different people, they'd fill different things in, but where do I get the information from? That's another story that is going on a little bit long, but actually it's the internet. There was a wonderful, wonderful, I found a wonderful um, channel called NHK World, which is Japanese. It is 100% English about all and everything, well, everything positive in Japan. And from that, I got lots of ideas, but I discovered it through YouTube because people had actually um, uploaded some of the programs. YouTube is a great source of information. Okay, enough of the technicality. Let's see some nice, oh, that's just to show, but, but as well as the thing on the top, this is one of 36 pages where I, anytime I hear of something, I'll, I'll copy it, I'll put it into here, I'll put things under cooking or under 
This is how to get to a particular temple out of town. Here, look, vegetarian or vegan restaurants. I'm, I'm not strictly kosher, but I don't eat anything that is forbidden. And by the way, that's why I also like to stay in, in self-catering. I know it sounds a little pretentious, but I just feel, I'm with the locals, I love going around the supermarkets. And even though nobody speaks English and my Japanese, as has been mentioned, has stayed pretty stationary, if not gone backwards, we manage, somehow we manage. And I just like that experience of being part of, part of the society, even, even in a rare, rather superficial way. Okay, now this is actually two, twofold. There are festivals all the time. So it's another thing you might plan your holiday around. The particular, obviously I started cherry blossom and my third trip, six weeks, six weeks. The problem with cherry blossom, they always say is it's very fleeting, you could miss it. But if you time it right and follow it, different ones bloom at different times anyway, and there are 200 species. But also, the further north you go, the later it is. Even here in Israel, we see that with the red wave. So I planned my whole six weeks. I just followed the cherry blossom. So I had six weeks. But this particular one was my, the, the second trip. And I brought my flight forward, and that cost me money, unfortunately, but what the hell, for, because I realized I would otherwise just miss this, the Chrysanthemum Festival. Now, if you look at this and this, this may seem hard to believe, this is one plant. They call it the Thousand Bloom Chrysanthemum. And that's why I'm showing that this one, it's a different style, it's called Cascade. And it was actually invented in the 1800s in this park, uh, which is Shinjuku Goen, which is in Tokyo. And you can see, I wanted you to see, obviously, there's some kind of netting, but it is one plant, quite incredible. And there are so many varieties. This is one close up, that was another kind. And so that's again, part of the planning. It sounds a bit, um, what's the word? I don't know, but you know, a motto, a sisma, whatever. But I do a lot, a lot of planning, but the absolute rule is once you get there, let it go. If you get there, you get there. Sometimes you will, sometimes you won't. Otherwise, you just send, spend your life chasing your tail. I've, I've fallen downstairs and finished, had a day in a hospital on my second visit. I broke my elbow on my fourth visit. You know, there are things you have to fit in hospital visits. Hopefully you can fit in more optimistic things as well, but that is one of them. There was a day that I went to Okinawa on the last one. I, I finished up in the frozen north, but I started in the south where it was not tropical, but certainly warm. And I wanted to go whale watching and I booked it and then they canceled it. But you know what, that day I went for a walk. I discovered that there is a rope, a tug of war rope that is in the Guinness Book of Records. You've never seen anything so big in your life. And I saw that, okay, it's not a whale. It's a bit disappointing, but that's, that's when you, the beauty of, of you know, going with the flow you miss something, but you'll probably get something else instead. And in fact, it was also the day that I went to a castle, which maybe I'm a jinx, three months later burnt to the ground. I mean, it's just heartbreaking. They're rebuilding it, but it was, and I went. Had I gone whale watching, I would never have seen that castle. So be flexible. Right, now I'm going to do a, I'm going to try. Can somebody, Valerie, I can see you. Give me a thumbs up if it's okay. You can hear me? Everything's okay? Thumbs up? <laughs> okay, thank you. I think that was a thumbs up. Ah, oh, thank you, Philip. <laughs> so, it's going to be very organized and I'm not. Um, so this is, if you can read this thing, some of you may have heard about it, the scramble, which is, as it says, the busiest pedestrian crossing in the world with thousands crossing at a time. So I'm going to read you, this was my second trip. So I'll read you a little excerpt from my book wrote it, so why not? Okay, Shibuya Station is apparently even bigger than Shinjuku, and with even more exits, the chances of coming out on entirely the wrong side seemed high. But again, after a slightly shaky start, I discovered that there were actually signs that pointed to where I wanted to be. I needed the Hachko exit, and there it was, even in English. Emerging into the street, it didn't take me long to discover what I had come to see, a vast crossing, 
nicknamed the scramble, that gives the pedestrians 45 seconds to cross on any of half a dozen directions on different crossings, whilst the traffic waits, champing at the bit to be moving again. As I was to discover, many people choose to ignore every marked crossing and simply take any direction they please, whilst avoiding bumping into any of the hundreds or at certain times of the day, literally thousands of people who are attempting to do the very same thing. By the way, if you think it's an exaggeration about the thousands, just remember that in Tokyo, there are 37 million people. So it's, it really is thousands. No. I should point out that to the Japanese, not getting out of someone's way on the pavement is almost as heinous as throwing litter. Imagine, in many places such as shrines, there are no litter bins because you're expected to take your litter home with you. Where litter bins are provided in case of festivals, you will see banks of them with every kind of recycling provided for. I took my place, camera set, to movie. The light changed and we were off. When I got to the other side, for some reason, I decided that I hadn't made a very good job of filming it. And so I would do it over again. That's when my camera said there was insufficient memory. So I wiped out the recording to make space. It was then the battery died on my camera. Not a problem as I had a spare. Spare inserted, ready to go. And the camera died again. Don't ask me how my supposedly fully loaded battery could empty itself without even being used. As you can see, I did film it in the end and that's because I went back on another day and I even bought a spare battery. So I, was, I carried three batteries around with me. I mentioned Hatchko at the beginning. Hatchko exit, entrance or exit. So what am I talking about? Some of you may know the Richard Gere film that was based on this story. Okay, back to the book. That loyal creature, an Akita dog, who used to accompany his master to the station every morning and then wait there for his return in the afternoon, continued to wait after his master sadly died at work in 1925. Of course, no one could explain this to Hatchko. There is a bronze statue, you can see it there, there he is, of this faithful creature in exactly the place he used to wait. It was built in 1934, and so statue and dog sat side by side for a full year until Hatchko finally died in 1935, having waited in vain for 10 whole years. Hatchko died 80 years ago, but is still remembered. I haven't yet decided if I want to see him. His body was stuffed. And apparently he's on, a, he's on view in a museum near where I will be staying from tomorrow. Perhaps not. Okay, so now let's get back to our random stuff. This one, I'm, I'm really just touching on so many things. Um, the religion in, in Japan. This is one of the three largest Buddhas in Japan. So obviously Buddhism or and Zen Buddhism are, are part of the um, religious uh, makeup. But this is why I actually wanted you to see, it, again, modern, modern life. Please refrain, these were notices, please refrain from flying drones in the precincts of Kotoku Inn. And we also ask you to refrain from using selfie sticks in the interior of the statue. Thank you for your understanding and cooperation. I noticed that was only in English. I'm obviously Japanese don't need to be told. And this giant statue, you can go inside it. So you can imagine I was quite grateful for the notice because somebody with a selfie stick could do quite serious damage to your eyes. They don't even, as far as I know, to this day, they don't know how they cast this, whether they did it on the spot. I mean, you just have to look at the people. I mean, I'm not good on figures of height, but look at the people. Incredible, isn't it? Absolutely incredible. Yeah. yeah. My, my next trip, sorry, I can hear somebody, but only slightly. My next trip, 
if I ever get there, I'm going down south because I want to see the largest reclining Buddha. I've never seen a reclining Buddha. So that, that's on my agenda. So who knows, next, next year we could have another lecture. If you notice the signs, look at these. I, I, I couldn't resist some of the signs. They are so adorable. Is that not just so typical? Look, keep out. I don't know what all that was. Obviously in English, we need to be told keep out. But the rest of them, it's probably if you don't mind and if you wouldn't care and please forgive me because look at that little man. Who would possibly dream of crossing his threshold? And you can see they use these, maybe slightly seems to us, I'm not trying to judge because I love them, but we might think slightly childish, but it's, I think in my theory, you know, nowadays they're into manga, which is like comics. The illustrations are so important because I don't understand how anybody can read. There are three different kinds of letters. Now, if I look at this one, I can show off and I can actually read this one. It says, tomare, which means stop. And then it says, hidari omite. And this says migi omite, which means look left, look right. And the little panda gives you the clue. That actually is um, hiragana, which is the common everyday writing. But in amongst it, they mix, not separately like we do in Hebrew, they mix. If it is a foreign word, a loan word, it has its own complete alphabet. And you get in the middle of a sentence, a different letter. I, I'm totally lost with it. And then the third one is kanji, which I think is probably equivalent of e Egyptian, I forgot the name. Oh gosh, hieroglyphics. Thank you, hieroglyphics. Uh, it's the brain, obviously didn't occupy it enough. Um, they are pictorial and there are thousands of them. So I don't know how the poor Japanese manage. I genuinely do think that's why, and possibly many people would not be literate, that's why these little pictures have developed into really an art form. I, I took photos of so many. Um, okay, and then artistically, I started to take- I hear you, Pamela, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Now? It's gone? No? Well, I haven't done any- We don't now. have any trouble hearing. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Yes, not everyone. Oh, maybe it's just with our link, maybe because we're host sharing. Everybody can hear me? Yes? Yes. yes. I can see the thumbs up. Yes, we hear you. So, I, 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 it was random. This is the beauty. I mean, I love it. It's me. Other people were, maybe wouldn't. I love just wandering along. You know, I, that's why I like to stay. I stay in, I, my, I rented a little place in the not the suburb, but in the residential area or on the hotel. And things catch my eye because I'm not in a hurry. Uh, and I, I do, I travel on my own and I've discovered that I like it. Maybe it's a bit selfish, but I can just do whatever I want. There's no pressure. I can, you know, run, I can walk, I can sit, I can change my direction. And you've got time. You've got time to just look. And I noticed that some of the, the uh, manhole covers were very attractive. And then I realized you know, you start looking at them more closely. They're often themed. That one actually seems to be a firefighting one, but they, they look more like samurai, but I think they're firefighters. But looking at this one, I was in this town. I just took a train and got off randomly because I had the free ticket. One day, it was a bit of a rainy day, jumped on a train, went for a couple of hours, got off, wandered around a town and then got back on the train. And I saw this castle. Uh, I didn't know that, the, I think there's sumo wrestlers, I didn't see them, um, but also it, the mountains are behind and there is Mount Fuji. So it's really a pictorial representation of the city. And apparently I wasn't as, you know, unique as I thought because there are people like train spotters, there are people collecting photos of all the manholes. And so any, I guess any more outside, any local council that hasn't done it yet is under pressure. So we're moving on, having mentioned Mount Fuji, to, let me get this right. Okay, so we can see here on the left and here, these are from wood blocks from somebody you probably will be familiar called Hoxai. If they're not familiar, or you think that he's not familiar, as you can see, 1760 to 1849. The next picture will reveal all. Yes, anybody not know this picture? 
This is called The Wave. And there are actually 36 pictures in the series. This is perhaps the one that we all know, the most famous. And if you look at it closely, and I really even, I have seen it before, but just doing this slideshow, um, I looked at it again and you have just to think, this, I mean, it was beautiful as a painting, but this man has carved out of wood every single detail so that as the, I don't even pretend to understand how they do it, but I think they lay layer upon layer of color at different levels and how it doesn't smudge, I do not know. And this is the intricacy of him carving out of wood every single drop of spray. Now, I wonder if you've ever noticed, <laughs> you can wave and nod your heads if you have, because it's the wave, who looks closely? Look at this, have you ever noticed this? What's here, what's here? And what's here? There are fishing boats. Japan is blessed with some things, but it's also cursed with earthquakes, with tough environment, and they rely very much on food from the sea. And when you've got nothing else and there's been an earthquake or maybe your, your fields were, were disrupted, then these brave souls go out into the ocean, rain or shine, storm or calm, and it's just such a beautiful picture. But the third thing, which um, this is very weird that I can't talk to you, but um, probably you're all nodding and saying we knew that already. But I'm just, <laughs> I'm just so love it that this in the background is Mount Fuji. And Mount Fuji is so special to Japan. And I'll read about it in a second. So in fact, I'll read about it now. This is another little excerpt. This is on the day I actually took. And another thing, obviously, budget, balance, whatever. I like using trains. I love, I use, I'm claustrophobic, but manage to use the underground. Um, I, like, I like that mixing with people, but sometimes it's practical to either take a private guide or perhaps a walking tour with a group of, you know, like-minded people, or also, um, to take an, I haven't done it since the first time, but to actually go on an organized bus tour. And this was one of them. To get to Mount Fuji, I, I'd been, I'd managed not to see it twice. So I wanted to see it. So I got a bus tour. So this is a bit of the day. Lunch over, it was back to the coach. It was then that the mist, this was autumn, remember, <laughs> December. It was then that the mist really set in in earnest. Why we continued on our program to the Mount Komagatake ropeway is beyond me. As we arrived, the slight drizzle turned to heavy blustery rain and the light began to fade. This roadway is what I would call a cable car and with us tourists packed in like sardines, it transported us swaying terrifyingly to the top of the mountain. As the tour blurb enthusiastically said, climb by aerial tram to the top of Mount Kamagatake and get fantastic views of the Owakudani Volcanic Valley, Lake Ashi and Mount Fuji. Or in our case, fantastic views of each other's miserable faces as we were standing huddled together and not a lot else. It also spoke of sweeping views of Hakone National Park. All we were afraid of was being swept off the mountain into the park by the sweeping wind and rain. After an equally fraught descent from the mountain, we returned with relief to our coach, which took us down to a town near the ocean. From there, we transferred to a bullet train, which brought us comfortably and speedily back to Tokyo. A word about Mount Fuji. I may have sounded a little flippant in describing the day, but I have to say there is something special about the glimpses we had of the mountain. It is one of Japan's three sacred mountains and is held in great reverence. It has been a pilgrimage site for centuries. It's the country's tallest peak at 3,700 meters, which should make it easy to see, especially as it stands high above any other mountain but the clouds that drift across frequently obscure it completely. So one moment you see it and the next it has completely disappeared. This while the lower smaller mountains in front of it are still clearly visible. I could easily understand why it has such a mystical appeal. 
Being volcanic, it also has a unique shape that again causes it to stand out against all the other mountains in the region. Once seen, you would never mistake another mountain for Fuji San. San being the honorific, always added to the you can see from my not especially wonderful photo, it really is surreal, beautiful. Okay, this brings us on to a theme that I'm sure you all have all heard about. Uh, everyone's heard the same story, and it, I'm sure it's true, that if you left a wallet on the table in the cafe and you went back four hours later, it would still be sitting there. I'm sure it would. I actually left, think about it, I actually left my camera. I, I took a walk, which turned into a nine kilometer hike, down the Sumida River in Tokyo. And at some point, I stopped to take a photo and at some other point realized I hadn't got the camera. And I'm, I do admit I kind of hurried back, but uh, you know, how many people must have passed it? There it was sitting there. And this is the same, I was in the country wandering along and I saw this, take what you want, leave the money in the pot, all nicely labeled, there's the pot. And this one, I didn't need any vegetables, but another time I found this, and, and, ta -da. can you spot what I got? I'll show you. There we are. I spotted these gorgeous bamboo dishes. And there were, you probably can't see because your picture's in the way, but it's 100 yen, anything 100 yen, which was three shekels. And some schoolgirls came by without any English or me, without any Japanese. They, I managed to confirm that this genuinely was all I needed to do was take what I wanted and put the money in the box. And this just, just in passing when it occurred to me, it's the same kind of theme, is this was actually in Osaka. I, I, and this is the street. Can you imagine even, I'm, I'm not saying that Israel is bad, of course it isn't, but really, can you imagine in England, leaving all these bicycles outside your house and toys so it just shows that's part of the, the um, safety of the place, which by the way is another reason why I'm not a brave lone traveler. Japan is incredibly safe. I don't think I'd travel anywhere else in the world. Okay, so let's see what we've got next. <laughs> I'm sure you're dying to know about toilets. Am I okay for time? I've completely lost track. Okay, anybody not interested in toilets, you can leave now, or possibly this is time to say if you want a comfort break, push off, but you won't get a comfort break like this one. This is in one of the apartments that I, that I rented, and believe me, it was not a luxury apartment. So this is pretty, I assume, pretty standard. This is the one on the right, and you can see you've got a built-in beader, you name it, it's there. And even without any English, I, I experimented. It was very comfortable. Uh, I've noticed actually they've just started selling in Israel. You can fit one to the toilet, but I can't imagine it's going to be the same. I can imagine it shooting up and all over the place. These are properly built. Now, the second picture, the inset picture, is actually, again, believe it or not, in a public toilet bathroom. Uh, if you look here, you'll spot there's some Braille on it. And this is all the buttons for a similar to this kind of loo that is on offer. You've got your stop, your spray, your B day, you've got your water pressure. I mean, really, you know, your comforts, you've got, to, you've got to get to the bottom of these things. You know, what can I tell you? Sorry, terrible. So you what's can't control what, this. What's volume? <laughs> Sorry? What is volume? Ah, good question, and that's the one I'm getting to. This one says sound. It turns out, it's a, a strange, nobody can, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be an expert, it's my observations could be entirely wrong, but you get impressions, and the Japanese love, I'm going off at a tangent, but I'll come back, love um, what they call an onsen, which I'm too prudish and pathetically feeble to have actually tried because they all you have a shower first and these are sort of natural spas or the water is natural when it may be made it like we, we have like hamat gader um but the difference is you're not allowed in with clothes or swimming costumes you have to go in naked now as far as i know that i don't think they're usually mixed unless you're a family and you've got a private one but nonetheless as i say i'm, I'm a british prude but it turns out the Japanese are more prudish about something else. They were wasting inordinate amounts of water because whenever a Japanese person went to the loo, they would press the flush 
first. And so when they discovered that is, you can answer two questions, Steve. You can now press a button, thus saving millions of whatever it is of water. And the sound is the sound of running water. And if you feel you need it, you just turn it louder. I think we'll leave it to that, shall we? Okay, moving on. Now, this is a second thing, and I really think we should have these here. I hope the picture is clear enough. I mean, I know it's a clear picture, but whether you can see from the angle what it is. For two reasons, this is a brilliant idea. One is that most Japanese homes are very small. So everything is a premium, space is a premium. And this in a separate, I, played, I stayed in an old machia, which is a, an old uh, Kyoto house. This is where I fell down the stairs later, but we'll draw a veil over that one. Um, and it was, every space was, was precious. So there wasn't a separate sink. This is the sink that you wash your hands after the loo, but because it's over the cistern, it has a second use. The water is recycled into the cistern. So what you wash your hands with is then used for the next flush. Uh, of course, I'm looking at it now and thinking, did I seriously leave my toothbrush in there? I, mean, I had to clean my teeth there, it's the only sink, but really, not terribly hygienic. Or maybe I put it for the photo. I'll, I'll give myself the benefit of the doubt. Otherwise, you'll, nobody will be visiting me with that level of hygiene. Okay, again, I said before, there were different ways. Sometimes it's just me and I've, sometimes I've watched a program. I've got the map of where I want to go from the program. But it's, what's lovely to do is the local walking tours, because of course they're much cheaper. Uh, hiring a guide for the day, well, I couldn't complain because I, I used to take the same kind of money. Um, but, and that's great for certain things. But at other times, this guy, look at him, Joe, calls himself Samurai Joe Okadi. There, he was only 88 years young. He's now 90 something. And I don't know about the pandemic, but up till then was still guiding. And he takes you on the most fascinating walk from shop to shop, from alleyway, different things to show us all those minutiae that you would never find yourself, or if you did, you wouldn't know what you were looking at. And he calls himself Samurai Joe. He's actually not that old. I think he'd have to be 200 years old, but he has a samurai sword and he uses it, knows how to use it. And he, and it's a real one. So I will move us on one thing so we can see him in action. And I'll just read you my third excerpt. The group seemed quite confident in Joe's abilities, but my heart was in my mouth. After all, this was my second second visit where I went with Joe on a tour. After all, I had seen Joe almost two years ago, and I can definitely say that he had aged and become more frail. To demonstrate that his sword genuinely was a real McCoy, he slashed a bamboo pole, cutting through it like a knife through butter. A strange Japanese veggie was decapitated. I believe it was a daikon radish. His most terrifying act was when he had a volunteer, this guy, lay on the floor with another vegetable balanced on his stomach. Like those strange oversized vegetables that enthusiasts grow for shows, this was no small example, but was still not to my mind large enough. Joe's sword flashed down, sliced through the daikon, and stopped just short of disemboweling the volunteer. I was enormously relieved. I imagine the volunteer was too. <laughs> Do not know how he volunteered. Anyway, on we go. Oh, sorry, I just flicked. Um, just, this is just one of the many things that, again, with Joe, it wasn't just shops. He wasn't just trying to decapitate people. This was, a, as it says it there, view from the veranda of a tea house in the park. We went in the tea house and Joe gave us a, 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 an explanation of some of the finer points of a tea ceremony. Isn't that, I mean, just look, isn't that? Can you understand why I have to go back? Is that not just Gordon? Bear in mind, I'm not the best photographer. Imagine if I could do it justice. Okay, so moving on. Different people are part of my holiday and part of the experience. And on my second, 
or third, no, it was my third visit, I was lucky enough to have this gentleman as my Airbnb host. In all the Airbnbs I stayed in, I never once, except him, met the host. I'd got keys to boxes and messages. You can't talk on the phone because you can't get the right SIM card. Never met, never interested. There was one I got there. There was there was no dining table, no furniture. So I sent him a message and said, there's no dining table. And his message back was, well, I don't have one in my house. So I ate on the bed. I don't know how clean his bed was after I'd gone. That was his problem, wretched man. Um, but this one, I, I struck lucky because Joe owned, I don't know if he owned the whole building. I wouldn't be surprised. But it was like an old tenement like you see in London, just two, two floors. And on the, the second floor, it, it must have been divided. It was once upon a time, three apartments. And he and his wife lived in a pushed together two, and I had the one at the end. The bed is the most uncomfortable bed I've ever slept in. It's it's old, but I go that I'm going there again. I've been there because of this man. He and his wife, they he would email me every morning, never interfered, never knocked on the door, but emailed every morning to check I was okay. Anything I wanted, he would be there. He took me to see a bonsai um, garden, not a garden, a, a nursery, and we actually luckily saw the master at work, and he took me on another occasion, actually again last time, to, well actually I paid this time, he, he wanted to treat me, but I insisted because he'd done so many things, it wasn't that he wanted, he took me to a sushi restaurant, and it's set in, this is a half size sumi wrestlers ring, so it's a practice ring, I didn't see any sumi wrestlers, which I can't say I'm sorry about, when I was there, but these two lovely guys were there, and it was great, because as I said before, I'm not, I'm not claiming to be kosher kosher, but with with Tony, and it's not his real name, but he goes as Tony. Um, uh, with Tony with me, I could he could interpret, and so I could try all sorts of different fishes, uh, which otherwise I might not have known what they were. And after I've done, been on this, I wrote obviously my daily journal, sent it to Tony as well. And when I went back this time, um, they greeted me like a long lost friend, and they produced from behind the counter. This is two years on that. Tony had printed up for them my review, so to speak. They don't speak English, but they still had it there. And then they presented me with a piece of paper, which has turned out to be beautiful. It's only black and white. It's washi paper, the beautiful Japanese paper. And I'm not exactly sure what it is, but it's to do with sumo wrestlers. And it has a stamp of one of the top sumo wrestlers that he had presented it to them. They gave it to me. I'm telling you, Japanese people, forget the war. We'll draw a veil over the war. I've had nothing but kindness. So, and these are another, this has been part of my adventures, meeting different people. I, as I said before, YouTube is a terrific resource. And I started to watch these two guys. This is, this is uh, Satoshi and this is Shinichi. And they, they had a program, still have, uh, a YouTube called Tabby Eats. Since then, they branched down the Shinichi's world and another one that Satoshi does. And I was watching them. They're foodies. A lot of the time, they, they test or eat convenience foods. And sometimes they cook. And sometimes they travel for food. And what they were doing at the time when I caught them was lots of people were sending them foods from all over the world. And the reason I was watching them was the kind of other side of the coin that I could watch something and say, oh, I could eat that. And then they'd mention the, something that went into it. I discovered fish cakes I can't eat unless I like squid or whatever. There's something slipped in. So that's why I started to watch, but I stayed because they are, they are a couple and they're the most lovely, lovely guys. And it sounds weird, but they also do live things and I've typed and we, you feel like they're friends. So I send them, you can see here, Japanese try Israel food for the first time. You should look these up because they were wonderful. And uh, so there he is with his bamba, and there he is with his tahina. And and um, and then I sent them another one and and we we made a connection. And I one time when I went, I managed to meet up with them. And this was on another time. Uh, they invited me for lunch. So I am on a YouTube. Pamela and the Satoshi, lunch with Pamela and family. So I'm with them. And the last time I went, I'd broken my elbow. I was in a splint, couldn't move my elbow. And I wasn't going home yet, needed an operation. But I was determined I was not going to miss. I was meeting them. 
and we went to the most amazing light museum and they were so kind and looked after me it would really it, it's something amazing uh this this uh, he was actually brought up in in Hawaii, and this was his mother was just on a visit. She features in everything, but uh, anyway. Uh, so this is just, again, it's all about people. This is a lovely guide who I've used on two separate visits. He's just fantastic and took me, as you can see, this is on a lake and they grow reeds for um, fencing and roofs. I would never have found this place. He sorted everything. And it wasn't a limousine. We went on like seven trains, buses, I couldn't have done it myself. And he's also great company. So that sometimes when you're on your own, it's nice to have, you, you balance the, the costs and, and whatever. This was another guide who, we climbed this mountain, took us three hours, he thought it'd take an hour. He didn't know how old I was. And we got to the top of a view of Mount Fuji, it was hidden in cloud. And this is just somebody we picked up on the way, he's only 17, uh, he didn't have a mother. So I guess his father, I'm sure his mother would never let him come on his own from Holland, but he joined in with us he, and he, was, he had a lovely day and he sang to us and now we're YouTube friends. This is so Japanese. This is a bowl, as you can see, and it's a pottery called, or a May making pottery called Raku. And by sheer, sheer coincidence, so much is timing. The night before I was due to go to this fair, this um, flea market fair. This is where I bought the obby, by the way. And I uh, was watching a, a, an English program, British program, the great pottery throwdown, and I'd never heard the word before. And that night they did Raku pottery. And you can check it yourselves, but I must have some, I thought, because as they said, Raku originated in Kyoto. And I was in Kyoto. So I got to this fair and I was actually, this is a day with a guide, but she's not on here. And I said to her, before we go off on the other things, we met at the, the flea market, help me please, I want a raku dish. And she found this and I looked at it and I wasn't quite sure. Um, it's actually iridescent, but you have to see it close. So it didn't look so exciting. And I thought, well, I might look for another one. And as I walked away, I'm sure we've all done it. I said to myself, hang on. It's here now, you're not coming back. For goodness sake, go get it. And as I turned to go back, this lovely young girl and her family, they had it in their hands. And obviously, I don't know whether they, I'd drawn their attention to it, but they were obviously contemplating buying it. But the minute I, they saw me, it was like, no, 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 you, you must have it. And this is, again, I think is, I'm sure not every Japanese is, is, is polite and law-abiding, but the ones I've met, the lady of the store obviously must have seen this, and my guide haggled with her, which I didn't know you could do. I don't think I'd be very good at it. And I mean, this is what's incredible to me, not just that she haggled, not just that she got the price down, but hang on, there's two people. You can have a price war. You could push it up. Who gives a discount when you've got another customer? standing there so you know it just all adds to that lovely feeling of of you know even if we can't talk to each other we somehow communicate and they had just various other people again I'm, i don't know how many of you are thinking of going to japan but this is another thing i discovered was that often local and they may even have it here i'm sure actually we do locals volunteer i have a friend who does it in never said it not did it in never said it locals volunteer to give a free tour Sometimes you pay their expenses, sometimes, you know, they may need a car or something, but they're not doing it for the money. And I wanted to go back and do the lacquer, I want to see the lacquer work, like the, the gold leaf lacquer work at the beginning. I found a place and I found that they had one of these schemes. I arrived at the station in the middle of nowhere, so I don't even know to this day exactly where I was and how I found it. And this lovely young woman and this, as a guy, were waiting with a a car just for me. I felt like royalty, but I also kept thinking, do they think I'm a marketing manager? Do they think they saw my email? It said guide or something. It didn't say guide actually, but you know, it says tours. I felt, I felt really, but no, this is what they do. They took me where I wanted to go. And I was greeted by this gentleman who was the manager. And I was given this unbelievable tour of this 
a fantastic visitor centre, not a soul there except me. There were the craftsmen were sitting in their little glass boxes doing their crafty things. We we got I got the personal. They talked. They translated. He talked. He explained what he was doing. We went round, and then I did the little workshop. Now this actually they they offered it. So obviously clearly not that they were asking, but I must do it because I need to pay something. They wouldn't take any money. So this is my dish. I didn't do all of the lacquering. I, all I had to do was scrape out a pattern and fill it with gold. So that that's me. But this is, I mean, I, they took this photo and I just realized, you know, it's almost instinctive. Everybody's bowing. Probably why they haven't got so badly with the pandemic, you know, because they don't shake hands. They wear masks and they bow. Maybe we should start bowing. I don't know. I think I prefer it to an elbow. I mean, you give someone an elbow, it's not very nice, is it? <laughs> Usually you get in the sack or, you know, you're, you're just broken up a relationship, but, you know, a bow, rather nice. So I'll tell you, I'll come back to that in a second because I'm moving on to food. And while I was there, just before I left, it was already about three o'clock and it turned out they had an in-house little restaurant, which ladies of the lo local ladies cooked. It was incredibly cheap and it was, it was vegetarian, which is very handy. And I had, it the, the comes on a tray and I had all the different things you can see here, all the, everybody has the same bowls. And I, uh, I was chatting to, to, to my companion and I had some of the soup and I had some of the rice and then on the tray at the back were more things. So I very quietly, you know, you don't, you don't grab, do you? You don't lean over. So I just turn my tray around and it really almost hardly registered till later. She very quietly turned it back. I made no comment. I didn't understand it. And I suppose I forgot about it. But then I went to my cook, one of my cookery lessons with the lovely uh, Yoshimi and good or bad luck it turned out to be a private lesson other times I've done it with a group other people which is fun but it was very nice and as you can see tofu tofu cooking four recipes not bland at all and she explained the etiquette and in reverse to us this is how I don't think people would be offended but how easily you can think that your custom is theirs and it can be the opposite you have near to you the soup and often rice, and then other things at the back. And the idea is the ones at the front are the ones you hold. You can actually drink the soup. They don't always give you a spoon. You eat with the chopsticks what's inside. You drink the, the soup. And the left-hand bowl is often the rice. And things, other things, you might hold them over the rice or eat with the rice so you don't dribble, I suppose. And the things at the back, etiquette says you reach over with your, with your with your chopsticks and the penny dropped. And when I brought mine to the front, that was bad manners. You leave it and reach over. Now, what was also, there's so many rules, I won't, I won't even attempt to tell you them all, otherwise we'll never go home tonight. Well, you are home. Ah, that's okay, you're home. You don't have, at least you don't have a journey. Um, the etiquette of chopsticks. Some you, it's not the end of the world. You shouldn't point with your chopsticks. I did find myself doing it once. Not intentionally, but it's in your hand. You know, we're Jewish, we use our hands. Uh, anyway, but what you absolutely mustn't do is you must not pass, pick up with your chopsticks and hand them over to somebody else to take on their chopsticks. And the reason is death, burial. In Japan, they cremate, but they don't cremate as far as I know, like, I, I, I mean, I've seen all the films, there's always an urn, isn't there? They cremate and stop sooner, so there, there are always bones left. And then ceremonially, with very long chopsticks, you pick up bones, pass them around the relatives, and then put them into the urn, or whatever it is. They have a mausoleum, a family mausoleum, and the, those small amounts go in. So you don't want somebody passing your food like it's a bone of a dead body. So I understood that was absolutely a no-no. But you are allowed to take it off your plate and drop it on their plate, which I was grateful to find out because I'd done it the previous day with Akira when he'd take me to some lovely restaurant with too much food. So there we are. So let's move on because we haven't yet, and it's getting very late, got to cherry blossom. So really this one, we'll do a lot of just ooing and aahing and moving on. 
cherry blossom, like I said before, depends on the season. So this was a screen in, um, in um, I can't remember if it was a temple or a shrine, uh, and the, the season is cherry blossom, and here's a fabulous picture. This is just looking up at the mountains. I got this by chance. It looked like a river of cherry blossom. It really is everywhere. But there are lots of different kinds. There's white ones or pink ones. This is literally growing out of the trunk of the tree. It's so beautiful, you cannot really do justice to it, even with pictures. Obviously, like, like anywhere, it's a wonderful setting for things like a wedding. They have parties, it's called a Hanami party, that people sit under the trees. It's, it's the end of this, the university year, you see graduates celebrating, like us with our flowers. Men, women, every age come out to stroll through the cherry blossom. This one's having a boat trip. I flew all the way north on that six week tour because I saw a picture on National Geography of this star shaped fort. And it was actually a photo of just the corner, which I know you're losing, but maybe we'll get it here. These are my photos. This is the corner that I saw a photo and I just said, that's it, I'm going there just to see that. And that was my six weeks. So as I finished, the blossom here was coming out the same as it had done in Kyoto five, six weeks earlier. These are just on the actual, I walked on the, on the island and I'm hoping you're noticing something about the trees and it links in with this. I, I actually have a film on YouTube of these gardeners. This is just one small bush, five, maybe six people working on it, literally using nail scissors, it looked like, using their fingers to prune the bush. And this is ongoing. This guy, as I've written below, taking his life into his hands. And I hope you are sort of noticing something. Here, it's, it show, this is what I want to say. They cut, they, it's space, they take out. So I've had people say, and I'm not knocking it, you stand in front of a cherry tree, it's gorgeous. You can just stand there forever. But ours, you just see one. The way they do it, the way they take away, the way they leave space, you can stand at one end of a row of trees and see every single tree. It, it's breathtaking. It doesn't have to be blossom. And this one, I think the reflection showed it absolutely even more beautifully because it's all part of it. The picture in the water, that would not be the same if it didn't have the space, if it didn't have what isn't there as well as what is. And that sort of sums it up. This is just a, one of the many, many parks. And you see this fantastic cherry blossom. That's what I stopped for and realized afterwards from the photo how much you could see beyond, behind. There's another tree it goes beyond. And that's about the Japanese have a love of nature and they spend an inordinate, inordinate amount of time unnaturally pruning and shaping so that it will look natural. But it is... It is well worth it, well worth it. Vending machines. I don't know if you know that Japan is famous for vending machines. These are pretty ordinary ones. Um, sorry, I haven't got more dramatic ones. You can get a beef burger, you can get a curry, you can get a pair of knickers. If you're up north, you can get something. There's these little heated pads that keep you warm in the freezing cold. You name it, you can get it in. But I couldn't resist. I hope you can see these things. Look at this one. You're seriously going to drink that? This is an energy drink, Pakari Sweat. I did not try it. I'm sorry, dear listeners, I did not try it for you. And this one, I'm not even gonna pronounce it, but if you remember how Japanese sort of don't really have an L and imagine the first bit comes out sounding like cow, I think you can see that that's another one that would not be enticing to drink. Can you see it? I don't know if it's big enough for you. Do I have to say the words? <laughs> I'm okay, am I? I don't have to say what well, I immediately read it as and heard it as, so I won't be drinking that one. And this was, I went up, when I was in the frozen north, um, I had a cookery class, which I hadn't checked carefully because it was Sapporo, and it turned out it was two hours from Sapporo, but it turned out fantastic. Went on a train, there were three other people I met up with who were also going for this private home cookery class. And what he did, this lovely guy, when he met us off the train, was he took us in his van to do all the shopping. And this is, yes, it doesn't drop, but this is a vending machine for eggs. And here's all the little instructions. This little lady's showing you how to put your 
what how delicious it will be and put your money in here and press your button and here's the package and take it home and at the end she says arigato gozaimasu which means thank you very much all the others were kudasai which means would you mind please so polite love it then we moved on to various other things including the fish and also this and it doesn't do justice to you. you have to imagine a tunnel that just goes on and on and on with logs piled in this rather interesting way. And here is what the logs are doing. They are growing shir shir shiitake mushrooms. It was thick snow outside, freezing cold, and clearly they don't mind. This is just some kind of sheeting. It wasn't, it wasn't th heated in any way. And now, if you look very carefully, where do they come from? How do they grow? I hope you can all see. There's something there, a little round circle. You can see another one, another one. There's actually one over there. And what it is, is the mushroom grower takes out a plug of wood and puts in a plug of spore. And that is what grows into the shiitake mushrooms. Quite incredible. And here they are on the grill, nothing taken away, just grill, nothing added. And this is just some, you just see the freshness of the food. Um, so that was one of my cookery lessons. We, I, I don't know, I haven't got the photo, but there was the most incredible red fish. Um, it looked like salmon, but I, some sea fish that we also cooked. Now, what this is about, two separate things. Because I said to you before, and I mentioned it, so this is sort of dotting the I's, I've, I've, I haven't, touch the surface because these are just some of my slideshows this is one at a nice festival this is one with the the birds that are so famous the cranes that dance in there nobody danced for me i missed that one only david attenborough gets dancing cranes but i did get very noisy cranes and it was wonderful for all that um so another time i i was um on a cooking class. And this, if you notice, it tells you how many views. So my dear friends who were inflicted with the diary, I certainly sent to more than 32 people. So I guess half of them didn't bother to look at them, but that's fine, seriously fine. Uh, but sometimes you get more, like 164, but this one was unbelievable. This was my first trip actually, and it was almost a fluke. Um, and I wanted to buy a kimono. She had no idea that I was going to buy one. We couldn't speak the language, but I managed to explain to her that I'd like to see how it was put on. And if I'd seen how it's put on, there's no way I'm gonna remember. So the other assistant kindly agreed to take a film. This is me. And it's, this is how you put on a kimono. Seven minutes and 46 seconds. She had no idea I was gonna buy and she didn't speed the process up at all. But what is incredible to me is that 33,000 people have watched it. It's quite incredible. I don't know if they watch for the laugh. I really don't know. So here we have even more, and this is it's still not all of them. So if you look very close, where was it? Down here somewhere. Um, yeah, this is this is the trip on the on the boat. Um, this was up in the north. This was the Wisteria Festival, which there's a 120-year-old tree, a tree that is the size of a giant oak, which is a wisteria. You can't even imagine. I did an architecture tour, so on. And this one, I've got two because I went twice, is the Tokyo National Museum, where I saw a, oh, by the way, if you're noticing, if you do want to look, I'm very original. Look at Pamela J. Levine, you can see some of these. Um, this is, well, here's the clue. I just slipped this in because I couldn't resist. This is not tiny. I was just having, I was in Kyoto and there was a shrine. So you go in and have a look. And I, f I think I found the hair with the amber eyes. So those of you who've read the book will know what I'm talking about. Those who haven't, it's about a collection of Netsuke, a Jewish guy who collected these tiny, unbelievably exquisite little, what are they? Basically, it's, it's, it's almost like a button. In the 17th, 18th centuries, whenever, um, men did not, well, actually women don't either, but men did not have pockets in their kimono. And so they would hang something off the obi. And they used this, it started with, I don't know what you'd call it really, um, 
toggle or I'm just trying to think, maybe a toggle. And it developed into an art form. This is one piece of whatever it is, wood carved. It's just exquisite. I hope you can see them because this is a serpent fighting a tiger. Mostly it's one piece. It might add a bit of glass for an eye or whatever, but mostly it's carved out one piece and it just is the most exquisite and tiny form of art. Now this was in the same museum, something caught my eye and it's so sweet. This is started in the 13th century, went right up to the 19th. It's a matching game. These are shells. These are, I forgot what they're called in English, hang on. The Common Orient Clam. And the game consists of 350 halves with the, the matching pairs and it's for a wedding. So that the happy couple get to play a game of matching. And what is so special about this shells, you can have a thousand shells. They all look the same, but only the pair that belongs together will go together. And the symbolism of this happy couple, only they fit together. And this is again, timing. The next day, had it been the other way around, I wouldn't have noticed. The next day I was wandering along, looking for actually cooking utensils in a famous part of Tokyo. And I spotted one shell in a little old antique shop. This is the shell and I bought it. And I thought initially, I was sort of arguing with it because I didn't know about this only one fit. I said, well, they don't match. And I, I understood afterwards, this is, there's like we have Shakespeare, they have the tale of Genji. And it's a long rambling tale, which I tried to read and didn't do too well on. And this guy, I think he's just a lech to be honest, or a stalker, because this is a famous scene where the lady is gazing out into the garden and he's taking a peep through the fence, a bit like uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. And so it is a match. But of course, now I know because it clicks together that yes, it is a match. This is, I'm, I am getting near the end. I don't know how you're all doing, but I'm getting there. Um, this is just touching again on religion. I mean, to put it fine, to put it honestly, I think actually the Japanese are pagan because they worship all sorts of trees and gods and whatever, but you know, so be it. And they are able, apparently, to be Buddhist and Shinto. So, and by the way, if you notice the white wedding, they've adapted that. Sometimes they even have like a church, even though it's not a church, because they like the idea of a white wedding. So they, they're, they're happy with that one as well. And solemn occasions are usually Buddhist and happy occasions are usually Shinto. I don't think there's an unbroken rule, but so this is all about death. Beyond that wall is a, it was a, a mausoleum and a crematorium. So this is part of a shrine. These are called Jizu. And it was, I think it was started by a very compassionate monk about a hundred years ago. And now it's very common practice. These sadly represent lost babies, whether miscarried, or died at birth or young. And because a baby when it's born has A, no chance to do good deeds, which it needs to get to the afterlife, not be in limbo, but also it's, it's almost considered it caused harm. It caused sadness to the parents. And so this monk who for some reason, he didn't have any children himself, felt a compassion and he, <laughs> to want of a better word, invented this idea that by giving a Jizu doll or, or statue or representation, it was like an honoring the gods. They were, it would be a plea to the gods to say, this is a gift from the baby that please let it carry on to, to a higher place, which I think is rather sweet and apparently brings comfort to people if you believe, otherwise your baby's in limbo. It's a very sad thing to think. And here we are, the other side, Shinto, a traditional Shinto wedding. Uh, I'm not really gonna talk about this because it's just, I couldn't do it without saying, of course, of course, and I'm not minimizing, but we've gone forever, temples, shrines, everyone is, is just beautiful in its own right. And this was actually interesting because I was looking, I wanted a castle as well. And this was when I went down, this is be, be, beyond Kyoto going south, uh, I had a train journey out to see Himeji Jo, which is a very famous white heron castle. It's supposed to look like a, cat, uh, a heron taking off. And I, and I realized, 
uh, what I hadn't realized at the time, when I was at the Asahikawa Fuyu Matsuri, which means Asi, Asahikawa is a place in the north, and Fuyu is winter, Matsuri is festival. This was a full a replica of this. This is made out of snow. Even it's an angle, so believe me, the whole castle is there. It was only when I was putting this together, I'd seen that, I'd taken photos, but I hadn't realized it was actually Himeji Joe, which is incredible. Even to the, I don't know if you can see it here, the walls, they are like stone, dry stone walling or Herod's walls. They don't have any uh, mortar, but look at the shapes. They're, they're just beautiful in, in their own right. And we're nearly at the end. And this sort of brings everything together. Remember, we started with gold, so we'll finish with gold. This is, I've forgotten, it's, I, I get it wrong every time, but I'm going to look up the name. Kink, kink, I don't want to get it wrong. Kink, 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 kink. Hang on, sorry, bear with me, honestly. Oh, for goodness sake, I was going to be so organized. Ah, Kinkaju, Kinkaju, which is in Kyoto. And I was there, that photo is... I think, I think it was my last visit. And apparently they've just re re redone the gold. It wasn't shiny enough for them. This isn't the original. In 1950, some suicidal monk, unfortunately, burnt the original down. It stood for 700 years. And then this demented monk, I shouldn't laugh, it's not funny really, but they've restored it completely and beautifully. And I think this just finishes it off for us. We've I have kind of lectured you, I hope I haven't, but just to set some of the things we've spoken about. Gardens are so part of Japan and you can see the trees, the way they've been cut. Now you can see how you look through. You can see another very important feature of Japanese gardens is always water and how important a part of it is the reflection, even the reflection of the tree that we saw before as well. The rocks, we know that rock gardens, this combines so many things and just to complete that, little lecture on how they cut through. What the Japanese do as well is they want it to be as natural as possible and they do something called borrowed scenery. If you look here at the back, it's not a coincidence that the trees have been trimmed up and down. So you can see the mountains through so that it seems as if the mountain is an extension of the garden. This looking through space, space, I did an origami, um, not origami, um, I forgot the word, um, flower arranging, flower arranging um, class. And that, that was the word she used over and over, space. She took out half the stuff I'd done and it looked twice as good. Actually, it looked 10 times as good. Fascinating. Okay, so we're heading for questions in a second. So there we are. Thank you for staying until the end. You can read it if you want. And the end of the, of the, how do I do it? Stop the share. Have I stunned you into absolute silence? <laughs> thank you so much, Pamela. It was really get our goes, you. Yeah. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. So do we have any questions? You can right. unmute yourself. If, are there questions? I've got a question. Okay, because I wonder if I've got time. I, I, honestly, you can all go. Well, you can't go home. You are home. I do want to show you if we've got time. I've got Netscape oh, things. Yeah. Anybody interested? You can't say no, can you? But if you want the question first to give you a break from my voice. Oh, but then I'll answer you. You'll get no break. I'm sorry. Carry on. Yes. Question. My question is not really about Japan. Actually, it's about it's about you as a tourist. You're obviously a. Um, You've obviously fallen in love with Japan. You've been four times, you're going again. And you're obviously a very serious tourist. Uh, the homework that you do and the planning. And, and my question to you is that, do you not feel that by always going back to the same place, you're paying an opportunity cost? Do you think about the places that the other, I mean, there's an awful lot of places in the world to visit. And I wonder how the Jap Japan is obviously taken your fans and you've fallen in love with it. Do you think about that aspect of always going back to the same place? 
That's a very good question because I've asked it a lot, to be honest. And I came to the conclusion, first of all, I have no idea of statistics, but how many is it? 400, 500 countries in the world. So big deal if I'd gone to three other places instead of Japan, I still wouldn't have scratched the surface. But it does, part of it, I love it. But part of it does come down to what I've said, I travel alone and I'm a woman. I'm not saying a man alone is necessarily safe. And I can find in Japan a microcosm of so many other places. I always wanted to go to, a, to Alaska. That was the other dream. And I, I, without any sadness, have given up on it. And that's why last time I went, I went on an icebreaker. I went on snowshoes. I went on a canoe down a frozen river. Why did I have to go to Alaska if I went to Japan? No two things are the same, but it's, it's not, I'm going back to the same place. But you know, having said that, as a tour guide for almost 20 years, I went to the same places in Jerusalem, the other big places, over and over. And every time you see something new. But in fact, I've got even better than that. It's not just seeing, you know, I go back to Tokyo, but as I said, 37 million people, imagine the size of that city. So I found in Japan, and I've gone for three seasons. The reason I didn't do the fourth is I don't need humidity and dripping. I can stay live for that one. So I, one day, may, well, maybe not, but one day maybe I'll brave it, or I might just go to Hokkaido for the summer because there the weather is different. But again, because of the changing seasons, I'm seeing different things as if it was another country. So why not go where I'm safe? And now I generally feel I've got friends. Let's not exaggerate, they can live without me, but you know, it, why, why? And there's so much I haven't done. There's so oh, good much. Good answer, good answer. Yeah. <laughs> okay, shall I show you a few? I don't know if well, I may. Wait, does anybody else have a question or a comment? Or, or you want to yes, go home? Chaim. Chaim wants to say something, Chaim. Yeah, Pamela, uh, a child in Israel or England goes into Kita Aleph and within about two months they can read and write Hebrew or English. How long does it take approximately for a regular child to be able to read and, and spell uh, in Japanese? I, I honestly don't know, but I do know, I can only sort of turn the other side of the coin, that many adults don't know all the all the kanji. The kanji apparently there's a core of kanji that you can that you can learn, but it takes right through to university. They're still learning kanji. The the basic one, I guess, that it's like any child, they will learn it at the same time. I'm just talking of schools, you know that they clean their own schools and the most wonderful films, and it's not cruelty. Little kids come into school, and the first thing they do, they're all on their knees and they zoom down the corridor, cleaning the corridor. They are so independent. I mean, I, I do find it disconcerting to see a five, six, seven year old on the tube going to school. And they're not neglected, but, they're, but maybe because it's such a safe society. So they're, I know I've gone off, it's not exactly answering about reading, but they aren't, it's not that they're, you know, they're, they're babied or whatever. So I imagine, I imagine the answer is hiragana fine and then struggle with the rest. But as I say, I know even at university, this people still take classes in kanji. Yes? About English, how, 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 um, how many of them speak English? Hang on, where, who's talking? Philip, Philip, where are you? Yeah. He's in the hobbit. <laughs> 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 the funniest thing, I mean, again, I'm gone and on. I can't explain how today, actually, the last trip, uh, even at the airports, they don't speak English. You think it's, you're dealing with the public. But the last time I went, they all had the little, you know, you press the button. You say what you want and it says it in the other language. I had one, but of course I couldn't make, get it to work. But, but <laughs> apparently I understand part of it is they learn very frontal, their accent, they are very, in this way, I, I, can, I, I hate it, it sounds like I'm stereotyping or, and it's not everybody, but in general, Japanese apparently don't like to speak English because they, they're not perfect in it and they are embarrassed. And so it's, and, and it is different. I, I fill in exercises on Duolingo. I get them all right. And the minute you say it to me, I can't understand what they're saying. It is different. I can read French and understand it, but I can't understand a French person. So 
but you get by. That's the answer is you get, I, I did realize once I stopped panicking that there is English. I mean, I, I even thought there weren't English signs, but like I went to, to use a locker and it's like a maze of, of Japanese. And then when I'd calmed down, there was one button that said English and it all miraculously turned to English. So I guess it's that they can, if they can, but I, I, I stopped looking at maps because I always got wrong. And I literally would get, I did it more than once. I came out of a train station, pouring with rain. I know I'm going for a private lesson in a private area. It's not a hotel or whatever. I was having an art lesson. Um, you know, East, this special Japanese art. And I, I knew that I could just ask somebody and there was a young couple with a little boy, toddler, pouring with rain. And I just showed them, because I always have it in Japanese, because you know, you can photograph it or, or cut and paste it. This is where I want it. Doko deska, where is, that's all I need. Sumimasen, you must have sumimasen, which is excuse me. Sumimasen, doko deska. And they get their phones out and they walk with you. It happened to me over and over. This couple, this young couple in the pouring rain with a little boy, somebody's nodding, you know this. It's not, a, it's not a myth, it's amazing. Walks with you because they can't, I think because they can't tell you. I was rescued when I got to the wrong train station. Turns out two separate lines with the same name, two separate companies, different place people walk me where I needed to go. I've got one, I actually photographed them. I, I, Cause they're coming towards you when you ask, if you think about it, they will turn around, walk five, 10 minutes I've had, take you where you want to go, then turn around and go back. So who needs a language? But somehow you manage, I don't know how, I don't know how, uh, but they say it's going to get better, but it isn't. I don't know how they're going to manage with the Olympics if they have any Olympics. So no, not, not, a, not a lot. Not a lot of spoken English. Stephen, Stephen's got a question. Hang on. Stephen. Um, I have somehow I formed the impression that Japan, Tokyo in particular, was extremely expensive. But you've shown us uh, prices which seem uh, incredibly cheap. So could you give a couple few words about how expensive it is? And then I wanted a second question was going to be, does ways and maps, do they work? So you wouldn't need to ask anybody. You just sort of follow your nose. How long have you got? <laughs> First of all, I, again, it's very hard to judge, because, but I do contend, this was not so cheap, that you're not comparing like with like. And what people always do, as I said, with my organized tour, as opposed to afterwards, you don't have, you're staying in a fancy hotel, check the price of a fancy hotel anywhere. You always go in taxis. I used my RAF cab, Japanese card, and transport was very reasonable. I, I don't eat in restaurants, but that's more for the kosher or whatever. Well, occasionally, I mean, as I said, I will eat in a vegetarian, but, but self-catering, I was buying in the shops and I didn't see like for like that prices were more expensive. The minute you go to any restaurant, surely, you know, if you're in Israel and you don't eat out every night. No, I'm in supermarkets. I'm not talking about restaurants, obviously. No, that's what I'm saying. Supermarkets. No, but most people don't see that side of it. And that's why you get expensive. Because you're actually on a holiday, if you think about it, every time you go to a restaurant or a taxi or, or a fancy hotel, that's what I'm saying, the impression. For me, I felt that it was like being at home. I, some vegetables were cheaper. So some of the fruit is unbelievably expensive. So you don't buy that one. They, they go for beauty. You can get a melon for, I got a melon in the 100 yen shop, half a melon. 100 yen is three shekels. I got half a melon for 50 one, one, one shekel fifty. In the beautiful, these beautiful supermarket stores, whatever you call them, was that one melon, one hundred dollars. <laughs> so you know, oh look how expensive it is. But I didn't buy that one. I bought the other one. So I, I, I don't, I can't judge exactly because I'm not very good at remembering prices at the best of times. But uh, it's like every holiday. And the second, you had a second question. What was? ways and finding a way around you you've silenced him can you let it unmute yourself Stephen? what was ways and finding a way around well, this this is a it's more problem actually of the answer to this one i think is every time i went out with google this is why i relied on people every time i went out with google the thing let me down there's one night i'd only just moved to this new it's not a hotel it's a little apartment in the middle of a suburb i couldn't find my way back and I, 
I didn't know what to do. I'm on Google, it stopped. It did not work when I needed it. I found two girls, they had no idea either. Uh, that one ended just by sheer fluke. That's when I realized I was actually by the place. I, I can't tell you what a relief it was. But I've been lost in so many places because Google is brilliant until it starts working. And Waze, I don't think Waze is any good because I'm walking. It's fine if you're in a car. I did try Waze and, and it didn't work. But the biggest issue, I think why it's not working, the issue is you can't, you can only get SIM cards for for internet and they're they're often limited in themselves the last time i went was the best one I, in the past i've used sim cards this time i actually hired a router or whatever you call it not a router the the thing you travel with is it a router oh, like a wi-fi thing it's like you plug in your own wi-fi i forgot what you call it oh damn it wi-fi router a thing that you, it is a, a Wi-Fi router. You can go out in the street and you don't need to find a hotspot or you don't need to use your SIM card. The SIM cards ran out. The deals were, were not good. So you can, you can do that. But the best thing is to have a picture of where you're going and ask a Japanese person. That, that, that's your answer. Unless you're driving. Yeah. Anybody more? We've got a few people here who actually been to Japan. Would anybody like to share any experiences with us? I can share an experience of meetings up with school children. Come yeah. on, Mark. They, uh, they, they came over to us and they um, asked us uh, very politely if they could ask us some questions. Yeah. And um, we said, yes, of course. So the first question is, um, what is your name? Well, my name's Leslie and they haven't got an L in the letters, so that completely stymied them. Hello, Reshri. I'm yeah, having... Reshri. So the second thing was, where are you from? We're from Israel. And they, that stymied them as well. <laughs> and then they asked, um, did we like Japan? And we said yes. And they asked us what if we bought any souvenirs. And uh, the only thing, I collect thimbles. Oh. So it, we'd actually just managed to buy a thimble from Tokyo and um, we, we explained that I bought this thimble. Well, Don has got a, a translator on his phone and he translated the word thimble into Japanese and showed it to them. And they still didn't have a clue what we were talking about. So their teacher came over and um, she thought that um, they were being rude and we explained what the problem was. And we showed her what we bought in, in the Japanese and she was then explaining it to the children. It was hysterical. It was so nice. And we had so many photographs taken because we're, we're sort of white, you know, foreigners. And, and we had so many photographs taken with groups of school children. It was just, it was lovely. Yeah. yeah. I, it's funny you should say that because I, I always, I kind of looked around some, like when I went to the Meiji Castle and it's that eight floors and you're climbing up and climbing up and I'm looking around and I'm thinking, I'm the only, I don't know who white's the word, um, Jewish, white, I'm the only white face here, I wonder what they think. Well, either they're incredibly polite or they actually don't notice because nobody stared at me. I don't know, maybe you noticed it, a lot of the tourists, I wouldn't know the difference, but the millions of tourists are from Korea or Singapore. Or, so to me, they're all Japanese, but they may just be used to, I don't know, but I, I never actually felt particularly conspicuous, funnily enough, or I expected to. There we are. So I just I want to show you just a couple of things before because okay. I wanted to show you this and just oh, the this is my thing. And um, I know it's not going to work because I'm trying to show it to you, but you just go like that. Now, you didn't hear a click or anything, but it's now sealed. That's the magic of it. Look at that. It, it, it's incredible. It, it's tightly sealed and only that one will fit. I want to show you just a couple of, mine are not the 10,000 shekel ones, but I did pick up in different flea markets. This is a Netsuke. I hope you can see it. It's a dragon. And I realized that it's actually a tooth, possibly of a way, uh, I think they said a shark. I looked it up. It's none of mine are ivory, I'm glad to tell you. The second one that I got was this one which is the cutest little cow. Now, what I wanted to show you 
is, I think my fingers are in the way. It has, I don't know if you can see them, there's two holes. So that's why we know it's, it's like a button, like a toggle. This one, actually, the holes are easier to see, I think. Yeah. And now when I bought him, I found out afterwards, he's, he's some kind of a famous monk. I thought, look, look at his head. He's got a kippah. That's a talus. I had to buy my little man with a talus. So that's them. This, I actually thought you were going to say, Leslie, I, I was interviewed once by, by a group of school children and afterwards I was presented with a, with a crane, an origami crane. I was presented with so many of these beautiful cranes, I made them into mobiles. And these cranes of you know, paper folding, they have a very tragic story. When I went to Hiroshima the first time, you see pictures made up of a thousand cranes. You see a picture, it looks like somebody just squidged little bits of paper like our kids do. And then you look close and they are the most minute cranes. And the story was after Hiroshima, people got ill later, you know, years later. And a young girl, I don't, not yet in her teens, I don't think, got ill with radiation, obviously because of the radiation. And they believe in Japan that a thousand cranes brings you health, wealth, good, not wealth, health, good luck. They'd say it's a good omen for marriages. And she started to make, she wanted to make a thousand because she didn't want to die. And she didn't make it. And her classmates completed the thousand. And it's become a symbol of Hiroshima, of peace, not talking about war, no whatever, but you see them all over and it's such an art form. And in fact, I had a wonderful experience on a train up north. Again, I don't know how we did it with no, no common language. The lady opposite me on a train and she's scrabbling away and I thought, oh, not very friendly. And after about 10, 15 minutes, she presented me with a crane. She'd been making cranes and she gave me the most beautiful ones. I won't do it now, but they, they are here. And and when I got off the train, I thought, what a shame I didn't take a photo, no, nothing. Two days later, I was leaving this tiny little town up north, trudging to the bus stop with my case to get to the airport. She was at the, she was at the bus stop. They lived in Okinawa, which is where I'd come from originally. I was going to Tokyo, but their flight went through Tokyo. So we flew together. And I, I can't explain it, but we were together for about an hour. And thank goodness we were, because she told me where to go. How? Not a word, not a word of English. Not word. And I know that she's got grandchildren, but I have to say the funniest thing was she started to show me photos. I oh, is that your grandchildren? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, and here's another origami that I did. And here's another origami that I did. She showed, and they were fantastic. But it's like show me the grandchildren. So that was that one. I'll just show you. Oops, one or two more. I mean, this is this this actually. I mentioned etiquette. So this I uh, is a. Uh, um, chopstick rest. My lovely landlord, Tony, gave me another chopstick rest. He also gave me, and this is an embarrassing story, this is a ginger grater. You grate that and it really works. It's amazing. It's made out of pottery with tiny little bumps on it. Uh, he gave me a couple of them. And I think I did a fashion, this is the thing, you don't know the customs. I was invited there one evening for a meal and I said, how lovely the chopstick rests, you know, these are pretty. And then they gave me a whole load. And I read afterwards, if you admire something in a Japanese home, they give you it. So that was, I don't know if it would have, it's a bit embarrassing. But well, talking of which, that was another thing I didn't mention, was how different it is. You have a, a tray of food and every dish doesn't match. And that's deliberate because every dish, you'll, you'll take a dish, or, you know, this is a tiny, this is a sake cup that I picked up in a, also in a, a, a fair or a market or whatever. And they will turn it around. It's part of the ceremony. You have to appreciate the work. Oh, what I did forget to say, it's really important, is you start every meal and even join the meal with itadakimas. And the only way I think to translate it it's like Czechiano. It's not bon appetit. You're not saying it to anyone else. It's that taking that moment to say thank you, whether it's to the food, the farmer, in their case, the gods, plural, and that appreciation. And that's what itadakimas means. You can't really translate it. And at the end of the meal, it's gochiso samadeshta, which is a, another rounding off of. And if you go to a Japanese restaurant and as you're leaving, you say, 
Gochiso Samadeshta to the staff, their faces will light up. So there's a hint for you. Uh, so I think I've shown, oh, I'll just show you one more thing. Again, because every, every aspect of their, their aesthetics are what appeal to me. So you look at this, this is just a piece of bamboo. Okay, you know, a bamboo is hollow. So you can see, oops, try not to, there we are. You can see it's a hollow piece of bamboo and then it stops there. Look at the other side. I'm sure you've seen these. People have seen them. This is from the tea ceremony. But look at it. That is that. It's not something added. They've just carved it and carved it and carved it into this. Isn't that just, I mean, the work that goes into it. I have a tea spoon as well. And it just looks like a piece of wood, a bamboo. But that takes about three weeks of bending and bending and bending and shaving and bending to get that so that you can have this little bit of tea for the tea ceremony. That aesthetic is just what I love. Okay, I think I've... <laughs> you've got your eyes propped up. Don't okay, so thank you very much. Is anybody else, anything, would, anybody would like to say something else? Share something else about Japan? Okay, so then uh, nothing left for me, but just to say thank you, Pamela, it's been really fascinating and terrific. And thank you, clap hands, everybody. <laughs> You can unmute them, you mean person. No, oh, I can only tell you. Say boo. Uh, unmute no, yourself. Can't. You can't. See you all at the AGM. March, oh, March the AGM. Nice. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for listening. Bye. Bye.